Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. And uh, it's been a great uh, course so far. I've actually learned more than I thought I could learn. So it's been great. Um, so today I'm going to talk about awake endoscopic spine surgery and my experience with it. So, you know, my uh, foray into uh, endoscopic surgery is a little bit different. Uh, I trained at the Brigham with uh, Dr. John Chi, and we were part of the SCOUT trial, which looked at using this OptiMesh, or this, sorry, I shouldn't use the name, but it's this uh, mesh uh, protocol getting into Kanban's triangle and so on. So when I finished residency and fellowship, I was very comfortable getting into Kanban's triangle. The way we used to do it is, if you look carefully, we have two C arms, one in the lateral and one in the AP, and you would spend a lot of time just setting it up, take about half an hour to set up. Um, the residents used to not like it, the uh, uh, radiology techs used to not like it, but we at least, did, at least get two good views. Um, and we were able to do these surgeries pretty well, but definitely could not do it awake because it, it just take too long just to set up and so on. So when I moved to Duke, I had two kind of things that I wanted to work on. One was access to Kanban's triangle, and one was the implant. So we'll just talk about the access to Kanban's triangle uh, today. Uh, so, you know, as people have talked about today, you know, it really is a three-dimensional uh, area. It's called Kanban's prism. Uh, we have been very obsessed with it this past year, looking at, uh, looking at it very carefully. So we did a systematic review looking at you know everybody that's done CT and uh, anatomical uh, boundaries of Kanban's triangle and you know not surprisingly we see that as we move down into the spine Kanban's triangle does increase but then you have the problems with the iliac crest and so on and as people have mentioned if you do a foraminoplasty you can actually get that area to be twice as large right so that really kind of tells a story about what we're dealing with um, we also showed that you know, if you look at either a spondylolisthesis or a disc herniation, that, that area can actually decrease quite significantly. So if you're thinking about doing percutaneous access and so on, you have to think about those things. Think about you know, how, size, how big your cannula is and so on. So the way we used to do it is we have this uh, initial dilator. We do triggered EMGs at five milliamps. And as people have talked about, you, know, you really want to be as caudal as possible. Uh, and you want to be in the mid pedicle line. So instead of doing two C arms, uh, when I got to Duke, we had one of our uh, spine surgeons, uh, Rob Isaacs, had developed this fluoro uh, instrument tracking. So basically, there's no uh, need to put a fiducial on the patient. The fiducials go on the C arm. Um, and it will also tell you in AP and lateral in real time where you are and importantly where you're going to be. So it tells you kind of the trajectory. Uh, so then we use this actually to enter into Kanban's triangle. And it's fluoro based, so it still has the same navig you know, the instrument trackers that all the other systems do. The way we've kind of developed this also, it allows you to track more than one instrument at one time. So you'll see uh, we'll put in two pedicle screws at one time. We can do pedicle screws. We can do laterals all at one time. Uh, and so then with this, uh, it really sh uh, shot down the time that I needed to get into Kanban's triangle. So in fact, this paper we sh uh, published in World Neurosurgery in 2021, we were actually faster using this one C arm with no setup time than if we had two C arms there and the half an hour of setup time. So now all of a sudden I'm becoming much more efficient, much more safe into getting into Kanban's triangle, and I'm able to do it much more reproducibly. So this was a real boon to us. Also for those people you know, that have trainees, I was able to t teach them more and actually trust them more because I can see both in AP and lateral where they are at the same time. Um, so, you know, actually, a lot, I have to give a lot of credit to, you know, our colleagues here. Uh, uh, Ray, you know, always used to push me, you know, you're doing this percutaneously. What do you know about the nerves? My, my chairman, Dr. Alan Friedman, would say, how about if there's a conjoined nerve root? What are you going to do? How are you going to, you might injure this patient. So we took this uh, one step further. And uh, Sanjay, I have to give you good credit also. You've, you've done a lot of this preoperative planning. I think, you know, preoperative planning is, makes the surgery much, much better. So we actually worked on mapping the nerves uh, using the cranial software. So we're actually able to map out the nerves at each level, know exactly the size of Kanban's triangle, taking the nerves into consideration and the bones into consideration. So here you can actually see, you know, if somebody has not a disc herniation, I can tell preoperatively which side is bigger. And so if I don't have to do a direct decompression, I'm trying to correct the spondylolisthesis, I can go on the bigger side. So this is what's you know, preoperative planning 2.0. So I can actually know preoperatively to, to a tenth of a degree and to a tenth of a millimeter just how big that is and whether it's safe for me to go inside. 
Um, we actually, this was really cool, we had a patient that we actually could tell preoperatively that they had a conjoined nerve root. So now I know that, hey, I'm not gonna go there because I know that that's gonna be dangerous. So if there's no reason for me to be at that side for a direct decompression, I actually can know that preoperatively. Uh, this is another paper that just uh, got published. You know, not surprisingly, when we took the nerves into consideration, we actually showed that Kanban's triangle decreased by a significant amount. So these are, you know, important things that you need to know preoperatively, and, th and now we're able to kind of know that uh, right right away. Uh, Sanjay just, you know, we're doing this kind of same thing. So now we're actually segmenting not just the nerves, but all the bones and so on. And then I can start, as you did, you know, take out other pieces of bone and see exactly, you know, how we're gonna be able to do this. Uh, we can analyze each level. Right now I have a poor medical student, you know, doing this uh, every level uh, uh, manually, but we're building actually a data set so that this can actually become automatic. So we're gonna use deep learning algorithms so that hopefully in, in a year's time when the patient comes to my, to my clinic, they get a basic MRI and then all of this will be done automatically. Uh, and that, and that and we're, we're building towards that. Uh, and I, you know, I need to say that just because you have a hammer, you know, we now know this person here, their Kanban's triangle was, you know, was only f five millimeters. That's smaller than any type of endoscope that you're gonna be able to use. So we know that we can't do just a basic Kanban's triangle thing. We either have to do a foraminoplasty or we have to find another way into the disc. Uh, so these are the future projects about the machine learning. Um, so, you know, those people that are kind of paying attention, you'll see that you know, for this percutaneous T-lift, there wasn't any direct decompression, uh, and I was using more of the MIS T-lift to do any type of direct decompression. And you know, I think it's a, it's a good surgery. You know, I usually do it using an expandable tube and so on. Uh, but I did show that, uh, and some, uh, one of our residents showed that, you know, the percutaneous T-lift, those patients use a lot less opioids. Right, so I think that you know being you know nice to the tissue on your way in really pays dividends to the pa uh, to the patients postoperatively. So really, this is where I kind of got the idea and you know started to push myself. You know, maybe endoscopy will be kind of the bridge between the two, between the percutaneous T lift, which is completely percutaneous with minimal blood loss, five or ten cc's, and on my MIS T lift. I maybe exaggerated a little bit here, made it so big, uh, but maybe the endoscope will kind of bridge that gap. Uh, so this is where we kind of got in. So now we can do direct you know, decompressions as well while we're doing uh, these endoscopic fusions. So now switching gears a little bit about awake spine surgery, why would we even think about doing awake spine surgery? We know that you know, general anesthesia is not benign. A lot of complications that can happen uh, with uh, general anesthesia. Uh, I have to thank Dr. Telfian to, uh, you know, he gave us props for this, this paper that just came out. So this was a match cohort study uh, for single level fusions, single uh, two level fusions, where we match patients with the same BMI, same age, and the same surgeries, whether it was MIS or uh, percutaneous TLIF. Uh, and we showed certain things. So first of all, um, Patients don't stay in the hospital when they're under spinal anesthesia, right? Uh, they can go home right away because they don't have the cognitive effects, they don't have the post-op nausea and vomiting. So we can see that 90% of my spinal anesthesia patients after a one-level fusion can go home within 24 hours. You know, if you had told me that as a resident, I would have said, there's no way, right? Um, our opioid use utilization was decreased by more than 50%. Uh, and the reason that is, is that when you're under general anesthesia, it's kind of an on-off, so you're asleep, you wake up and you're in a lot of pain, then we're paying, playing catch up. But when you're under spinal anesthesia, you're awake, the spinal anesthesia wears down slowly, so you can tell the nurse, hey, I need something, and they can kind of build that up. And so we can, you know, not playing catch up. Uh, we can also show that the, these patients ambulate faster. Um, and so this was a good study, and this was really apples to apples, right? This is a match cohort study. Another thing that you know, we talked about, and I think the, Dr. Hassan and me have, uh, have talked about, is that it allows you now to offer surgery to a bunch of oranges, people that pre previously simply were not surgical candidates. We had one patient, 92-year-old lady. She uh, lives in Tennessee. They did a kyphoplasty at 5-1. Uh, unfortunately, some of the cement came into the canal. Uh, and then it took them five days to extubate her, right? So, you know, now she's got a radiculopathy, you know, nobody wants to take care of this patient. She's 92 years old, right? She comes to me, we do a uh, over-the-top decompression under spinal anesthesia, she goes home the next day, 
right? All of a sudden, you can offer surgery to people that, you know, we already know that she did horrible when she went under, under general anesthesia. Um, so that's one method of, uh, uh, of awake spine surgery, and that's avoiding the bad complications of general anesthesia. Uh, I think other people have talked about, and this is another way of doing uh, awake spine surgery. I think Dr. Telfian does this. And this is just under local only. And this is when you want to get the eloquent context of when people have radiculopathies, when you do the decompression, when have you done enough decompression? And that's always a question that as spine surgeons, I think we, we struggle with. Um, so by using local anesthesia, you can monitor that nerve health and how the patients are doing uh, intraoperatively. Uh, this, this case really made me a, a big believer about this uh, awake endoscopic surgery. So this is a 73-year-old. He's a very intelligent man. He used to work uh, for NASA. Uh, he had an L4 to S1 uh, laminectomy somewhere else and had bilateral S1 radiculopathies, no back pain. They did a great job, you know, decompressing uh, centrally, but he only, and he only had leg pain. You know, I, sent, I showed this to my partners, and, you know, everybody was either T-lift or A-lift, and he's like, I don't have back pain. Why, why are you going to do a fusion on me, right? So this patient, he was very motivated. So we did an awake uh, by, uh, bilateral L5-S1 transforaminal uh, decompression. You know, these are the different tools that you can use. Um, I think that there's a lot of, you know, other instrumentation that you can kind of gently use to uh, decompress around the nerves. Um, and then we, uh, we use this uh, tracking system. So both for my uh, lumbar and my cervical cases, we're using this uh, fluoroscopy and uh, tracking to let me know where I am in both AP and lateral, and I can be much more safe and much more efficient uh, in how I do these surgeries. Uh, this is just a video. I don't know if I can play it. So this is just a short clip. Um, but you can see that I can see where I am both in AP and lateral, and I can see where I'm going to end up. So we're talking about, you know, where are you going to be? And we can actually do this from the skin. So I can tell from our transforaminal how to do that. So, you know, a lot of people are talking about targeting and so on. We've taken targeting to much, much easier. So it takes me two x-rays to target. And I know exactly where the resonance is going to be 50 millimeters in the skin, right? And so I'm not worried. So when they execute that plan, I can see in real time what's happening. And so that makes me a lot easier for me to teach trainees and so on to be there. Before, you know, even if we marked out the perfect incision, I don't know where they can be. And if they're too, you know, anterior, I think uh, Sanjay said you, you don't want to, you, you don't want to be anterior and, you know, uh, and do that. So I actually can tell where they are in real time. Uh, and so this has been a big boon to our abilities to teach and to actually execute these surgeries. Uh, so in this surgery here, um, at one level, the, the framing was kind of small, so I had to do a foraminoplasty here. So here I am just drilling up, uh, just clearing up some of that soft tissue. And here I am doing a foraminoplasty here, making myself some more room. I can see the epidural fat. I'm making, up, I'm opening things up. And as I'm opening things up, the patient's telling me, Doc, my left leg pain is better. So then, I, and I know that you know I'm pretty much done. So I can open up a little bit more, but I don't have to go crazy in, in terms of my decompression for him. This was done under just local, so I don't even have to wait for the spinal to to wear off. So as Dr. Telfian said, you know, there's no there's no spinal to wear off, there's no local to wear off. He just locked, really literally we flipped him over and he walked home, right? Um, and so this is really a, a good example about you know, what you can do uh, when you have the motivated patient. You've got to have a motivated anesthesia team, uh, but that's you know, some of the, the things that you can do. So I'm not going to take much more time. For, uh, thank you guys for so much. You know, I think that the future of spine surgery is doing this preoperative planning, really knowing what the patient's pathology looks like, making the best plans for them intraoperatively using endoscopy. You know, we've uh, published a paper about using the robot to enter into Kanban's triangle. Uh, I think that's coming up, and we've done that a few times for uh, uh, Kanban's fusions. Uh, and I think the, as more advanced materials uh, are, are, are made, we're going to get even better at these fusions. Uh, I think, you know, Dr. Hofstetter really has to be credited for, you know, not just saying, you know, I think the patients are doing well, but looking at the patient reported outcomes and so on. Uh, with that, I'll close up. Thank you.